It's our great pleasure today to welcome um, Jeremy Taylor, who's a biostatistics professor at the University of Michigan in uh, Ann Arbor uh, in the United States of America. And uh, today he's going to uh, give us a presentation on the evaluation of existing um, risk prediction models uh, in the presence of missing covariates. So Jeremy, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation, Cecile and Boris and others. So can you, you can see my slides. Let me just check that, everybody. Yes. So, yeah, very, very nice. So, so for those of you who don't know, I spent six months in Bordeaux about 13 years ago. So and all the familiar faces here, Pierre and Bloom and Cecile was a student. Then. Yeah, it was not 13 years ago. It was a little bit uh, more than that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it was in two, 2004, actually. <laughs> okay, well, was, time flies. Well, I had a very enjoyable time and I remember everyone was very kind to me and lent me furniture and found me an apartment to live in. So I much appreciated. We had a very good time. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about about this work. So this is, um, and I'm happy to have questions, you know, along the way. I don't know if you, Boris, maybe you'll just chime in if there's, if there's questions. So this is about, um, the title sort of fairly obvious, prediction models and missing covariates. And Pinley is a student who just graduated a, a few weeks ago. So this is part of her dissertation, actually. And then Matt Skipper was a former student from about 16 years ago, maybe, <laughs> something like that. Um, so he's a colleague now. Okay, so here's the, the setting. So we got a, a binary outcome variable, call it Y, and a bunch of baseline covariates, so X. And there's some model, you're interested in some model, which is a model or an algorithm which gives you, you know, spits out a probability Y equals one given X. So that's the, the setting. And, um, and so as you can figure lots of different sort of variations on this in, in terms of the goal might be building that model. The goal might be actually, you know, these models are supposed to be useful in some sense, helping decisions be made in a medical context, you know, what action to take, maybe for a, a patient or person. So actually applying it to an individual, or what we're going to focus on is there's an, someone's already published one of these models. So you have the ability to make that predicted probability. How do you evaluate how good their model is on a different data set? So it's the setting. And so there's, you know, there's thousands of examples of these sort of models in the, the literature. Um, these are probably you know, from the US perspective, but for breast cancer, there's a Gale model for predicting the risk of breast cancer diagnosis in the next 10 years. And there's lots of models for cardiovascular disease. One, and then there's lots of prostate cancer space in this, CAPRA score, I'll come back to a little bit more. We have an example sort of using the CAPRA score, which is a very popular model in prostate cancer. There's, there's thousands and thousands of these. And so, so you know, so why? Very well calling why is you know, something unknown, right? And it's a binary thing. And so it's something about the future is usually, usually important. So these examples were, you know, it's different, different things in different, different for different models. So breast cancer within 10 years or prostate cancer recurrence within three years. Or sometimes it could be, you know, the result of a test you haven't done yet. What's probably that test will come up positive. So that sort of thing. And these models X is usually a, a handful of covariates, you know, three, five, 10 covariates, something like that. So I'm not talking about high dimensional data here. And they're usually fairly common, usually easy to, to measure things, blood, blood pressure, family history of cancer, things like that. And so you, you can, plug in X and it spits out probably Y equals one. Right? And, it, and it could be a, a nice simple logistic regression or it could be some sort of complicated black box type model. So, okay, so back to these three settings. Um, so you can build a model, so then you've got, you have data and, and you know, you have Y and X measured for N people and you can use your favorite fitting algorithm, favorite sort of model structure and build some model. Um, or if you want to exist, apply the model, that's just to one person. Now you have X, but you don't have Y. So I'm going to look at this last setting. You don't have access to the, to the original model. It's a published model. Maybe it's online, a calculator or something like that. You can have access to, to using it, but you don't have access to the data that it was built from. But you do have your own data set. And you want to 
say, how good is that, that existing model on your data set? And, and so now we got sort of a main goal today is how do you do that evaluation when you've got some missing X's? So your data set, although these X's are usually common, you know, sometimes things are missed, they're not available always. And, and so, so, what, so when you say assessment of a prediction model, what does that mean? Usually that's like choose some metric which represents you know, how good the model is, you calculate that metric and then announce that, yes, that metric's big. So we got a great model, right? So the AUC, I'm assuming people are somewhat familiar with the AUC, the un area under the ROC curve, measure of discrimination. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So that's a metric that's very commonly used. So big is good there, bigger is better, good. Or Briar score is sort of a mean square error type. How, how close of a predictions to the Y values? We'll talk about that. So how do you actually estimate these things when you've got some missing X's from your data? So these are the metrics. Um, okay, so discrimination. So this is the area under the curve, that's this metric. Um, so it's also the concordance index. It's very popular, much actually much overused in my opinion. And we can talk about that later if you want. Um, a large AUC is, is, is good. Um, I think I got some pictures of what, what it means. Yeah, so there's some sort of cartoons about how you calculate the, the AUC. Right, so these are, we have a binary outcome, you had existing data and you plot the distribution of the covariate on the horizontal axis and y equals zero and y equals one of a blue and a red. Right, so discrimination is basically how, how far apart are those two, two histograms, those two densities. Right? So you can discriminate with people and that's, that's good. And so if you, so the AUC, you calculate by taking a threshold. So there's a cut point and you just move this cut point along and you calculate the proportion of false positives and false negatives and you plot it on this picture and then you look at the area under this curve. So that's just AUC. So it's a very well known metric, been around for a long, long, long time. And, you know, bigger is better. So if you have something which has a, very low false positive rate and a very high true positive rate to a particular cut point, it's up here. So you get an area under the curve of one. It's no good at all. It's just random, it'd be 0.5. All right, so that's just background. It's all very well known. Um, so that's one metric. And then another metric, a little more along the lines of, you know, is the actual predicted probability any good? Um, Right, because of an AUC, the discrimination doesn't really tell you if a predicted probability is any good. It just tells you you can discriminate people. But if you want to make sure the predicted probability is sort of close to Y, right? If you predict 0.8, that would be good because you, if Y was one, but if you predicted 0.8 and Y was zero, that wouldn't be so good. So you just take the mean square error, of the difference between YI and the prediction, square it and average it. That's the Briar score. And we, I think we've standardized it too. But so low is good. Okay, so this is two well-known metrics. So now the Briar score is a little harder to interpret. You know, I tell you, Briar score of 0.27, you'd say, oh, is that big, is that small? You don't know. It's all sort of relative to some other model. Okay. So then talking a little bit about sort of more general, right? Missing data problems. So I spent quite a bit of time doing sort of research related to methods for handling missing data in different circumstances. So there's a number of methods, but two which are sort of popular and have statistical justification, I think, are multiple imputation and inverse probability weighting. And so I'll talk about those a little bit more. They both involve models, right? So I've got missing data, missing X's here. You have to make models in some way to implement both multiple imputation and inverse probability weighting. So if you've got um, so multiple imputation, you sort of fill in the values of a missing X's. So you have to make a model in which X is on the left-hand side and all the other stuff's on the right-hand side. So there's a model there for X that's missing given the other X's. So that's a model, you have to come up with that model and, and the answer, you know, your conclusions at the end of the day will be a little slightly sensitive to that model. It's not generally super sensitive, but somewhat sensitive. And then inverse probability weighting, it also has a model, but it's not modeling X's, it's modeling probability of missingness. So if you know, 20% of the X's are missing, you make a, a model for a probability of missingness. So there's another model. Okay, so, so the question which is 
you know, sort of motivated what we've done here. So within both these methods, we need models. And should those models involve Y, the outcome? Well, we've got a missing X. So we've got some X sort of on the left-hand side, or probably a missingness on the left-hand side. What should go on the right-hand side? Should we include Y there? And so, okay. So here's, um, you know, just a cartoon of, of, you know, four rows of data. We've got a binary outcome Y, three X's, right? And you see X1 is missing a couple of, a couple of uh, And then we create this variable R, which is the indicator of missingness or not. So R is one if it's X1 is observed and zero if X1 is missing. So multiple imputation is going to come up with a model for X1 given the other X2, X3, and Y or not. That's the question. Should we include Y there? And then inverse probability weighting is going to come up with a model for probability R equals one. And so, um, you know, there's, I'm not sure I talk about it explicitly, but right. So, there, so there's a lot of resistance to people to including this variable Y on the right-hand side of these models. There's sort of this feeling of circularity. You're going to evaluate how good this existing model is at using X to predict Y. So if I use Y to fill in the X1, which is missing in some way, then aren't I'm sort of, aren't I making it look better than it really would be because I've used, I've used the outcome and it's all sort of some sort of circularity there. So there's a lot of resistance to including Y in these, in these models that are used either for imputation or for inverse probability weighting. Okay, so that's sort of a general knowledge in general i mean and I'll, I'll get a little more technical at the end and show why this is necessary but in general in multiple imputation if you're filling in a you know whatever you want to do um you're filling in a covariate sort of necessary to condition on all the other variables so that would mean in conditioning on the outcome as well right? people have looked at that quite a bit just sort of building regression models of y given x fill in an x you need a condition on y as you fill in the x um, and so in this world of prediction models, and there's people in, Netherlands is in Belgium, Belgium or Netherlands, I can't quite remember actually. There's a whole bunch of folks near, near you guys, somewhat near you guys. Um, the paper which gets a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of citations where they showed it for building a model, right? For the task of building a prediction model, you got missing X's, you'd be better you have to use the Y to do a better job at building that model. And so, and they've also written a paper I just came across recently by Moons. It, it says it's, it was all about missing data and prediction models and the title included, it's better to impute than to ignore. So it's sort of a cute, cute title, right? So sometimes people say, I don't want to, I'm just going to throw out a rows of data which have missing X's. To my analysis, but the title of that paper was "It's better to impute than to ignore." So, so cute. Anyway, as I said, people are very suspicious of this. Some sort of circularity going. They think there's some sort of circularity going on. Um, I guess my, by my tone here, you can tell that I think they're wrong. But <laughs> and I'll show you why. Um, okay. So then, you know, so we're going to basically going to come up with some schemes to do multiple imputation and inverse probability weighting and evaluate them in some simulation study and, and, and look at them on a data set. And that'll, that'll be my talk. Um, so, you know, you want to worry about things like bias and efficiency and robustness of the specifications of a model. And then in missing data problems, you need to sort of pay attention to the reason for missingness. The different techniques work or don't work quite so well, depending on why observations are missing. Um, so it's sort of an important thing to, to recognize and to build in or to use methods that deal with that appropriately. Okay, so here's the, so what, I don't know, I know some of you have been involved in prediction model stuff. Um, so what does it mean for a model to be validated? You know, someone, you know, someone in Paris builds this, this model and when you have data in Bordeaux and you, and you say, I want to try it on my data and I want to validate their model. What, what does that mean exactly? I mean, does it like me? You know, and it, loosely it means, you know, they, they claim it's good. 
is it still good on our data? Right? But, but what does what does it mean precisely? I mean, what you could get a little more precise and say, you know, they came up with an AUC of 0.82, which is a pretty good AUC. You know, you want do you get 0.82 on your data? Right? You could think of that more quantitatively as validating, um, or the similar Briar score. Um, but as I'll show you in a minute, you can't actually expect that to happen. If Paris got a 0.82. Um, you know, not only did they maybe cheat, but I mean, you, if you got a 0.79, it doesn't necessarily mean that their model is wrong. It's because the actual value of AUC doesn't, depends more, depends not only on the, the distribution you're interested in, which is Y given X, right? Models of representations of a Y given X distribution. The actual value of AUC is going to depend on the X distribution as well. So the people in Paris had a, you know, more females and older and more advanced stage disease compared to the Bordeaux group, you would get a different AUC, even if the model was the best you could do. Even if the model was an accurate representation of Y. And that's sort of obvious because, so AUC is discrimination, right? So how, how good is a model at discriminating two people, right? And if you're, if a Paris data set had lots of you know, extremes, lots of very old people and young people and, you know, lots of big range of stages, of disease and things like that. It would do rather, you could imagine it could distinguish those people, quite many of those people quite well. But right, so the Bordeaux data, maybe it has a very narrow range of age and it has mainly people who have the same stage of disease. It's going to be harder to for that model in Bordeaux to distinguish people. So that'll just give a, a lower AUC. So that's so 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 when you say validated, just getting the same AUC isn't, isn't really tell you everything you need. Okay, so I've, I've, got, I've just introduced this now, this CAPRA score, and then we'll come back to it at the end of the talk. So so this is a um, score which is used very popular. It was developed by surgeons, prostate cancer surgeons, um, and they. So these are patients who've you know, got a diagnosis of prostate cancer and they want to make some prediction of what's the chance of the cancer coming back in the next three years, I think. That's sort of, you know, they're going to treat them, they're going to do surgery or, or you know, largely surgery and what's the chance of it coming back. So they, you know, they built this model from a cohort of patients who had prostate cancer back from California. So CAFRA is the name of it. And it's, you know, I don't know about you, but it's the sort of thing that, you know, statisticians, we tend to not really like this way of constructing scores, right? They've got, so PSA is a simple, is a blood, you draw blood and you measure an assay and it's continuous variable, right? So they went ahead and decided they were going to make it into four le five levels, right? So they, they, they cut them in a categorical. And so each time you get a point of the way the score is constructed, you know, you look at a patient, you have these five things available, you get so many points, you add up the points, and then you look at the points and say, more points is bad, and they have certain rules about actions you take depending on the number of points. Okay, so they categorized that, so they gave scores, so zero, one, two, three, four, right, for PSA. So the Gleason, okay, so that's something, you take a biopsy, a little tiny bit of cancer before they've done the main surgery, they look at it under a microscope, and they sort of assess various aspects of it. You know, I don't know if you've seen pathology slides, but they look like clouds in the sky. But anyway, if you're a trained pathologist, you can give scores to, to, to those slides. And they give two scores and they, so they have this magical scheme. They get this point one, zero point, one point or three points. Somehow they managed to drop two points here. Um, so that was sort of interesting, right? So. Um, and T stage has got lots of more categories that made it binary. So age, I mean, age is not super important here, but it's clearly a continuous variable, um, but somehow they made it binary. Okay, so lots of things that, you know, statisticians might not like so much, um, but anyway, so it's very popular. I mean, so when you do this score, you add them up, and then you have, may, may have a table in my paper, probably of recurrence three, not, not having a recurrence of in, three years, so, you know, it has a nice sort of gradation here. You know, again, they pull together a couple of categories. Anyway, so that's the, that's the 
CAFRA score. And so we, we have, you know, this is a, a paper from a student part of our dissertation. My colleague had a data available from Mayo Clinic. So that's in, in Minnesota, it's in the cold part of the very cold part of the US. Um, anyway, 1,200 patients. And so they're, but they're, they're missing, oops. So this one variable, percent positive biopsy, and this data set is missing a lot of that value. So all these other things are very standard. This requires you, so a biopsy, you, you stick about 12 needles, very tiny little needles into someone's prostate you suck out a tiny little bit of tissue and you look at it under a microscope and you say, is there cancer in that tissue? And so this is saying what's the proportion of those 12 needles where you found cancer. So if it's bigger than 34%, that's, that's a lot of cancer you found. Where if it's less than 34%, you didn't find so much. So it's sort of an extent, measure the extent of the cancer in the prostate. Anyway, but so it's not always collected. So, you know, this data set is actually 90% missing. It's a lot of missing. Um, so, and, uh, so we're going to look at, we have a, we can made a three year, we have made a binary outcome out of this. And so, so how can we evaluate this existing score on our data? Okay, and here's the results. So I'll come back to the end to explain a little more, but here's the AUC. I'm a, I'm a right as a Briar score. And there's various methods. You'll see inverse probability weighting and multiple imputation here. And CC is complete cases. So you can get, you know, you get different numbers depending on how you look at this data, what method you apply to deal with the missingness. So complete cases is just take the 10% of the data who have all observations. And then the Briar score, you can see quite a dramatic difference in depending on what method you use. So, so, you know, variety of methods you could use and which is a meaningful estimate of the AUC on our data. Okay, so back to sort of trying to define what we mean by these metrics AUC exactly. Um, okay, so I've got a bit of notation floating around here. So E stands for external data. So that's for... Um, of a CAPRA score data set. Right? There's a population they, they use to build that model. So there's a distribution of X's, distribution of age and stage and whatever in that data. And then the distribution of a binary outcome given X. So there's, I'm thinking there's true probability distributions from that population from which that data was drawn. And so they built a model from that data and we assume they did a, a good job. So it's sort of an approximation of a distribution of Y given X. And then my internal data, my Mayo Clinic data has the distribution of X's and distribution of Y given X, um, you know, with subscript I for internal. So that's, there's some true distribution for Mayo Clinic patients, if you like. And then we have a data set N, which is drawn from this distribution of Mayo Clinic. So, you know, the actual statistic, the Briar score, you just, Take the predictions from the CAPRA model, apply it to the Mayo Clinic patients, you get PI hat, you compare it with the YI I know from those patients, and that's Briar's score. So that's, you know, that's a statistic, it's an estimator of a population quantity. So here's the population quantity. Basically, you just replace the sum by an expectation. Integrating Y minus P hat over the joint distribution of X and Y here. So that's the true Briar score. And so, so just know, I mean, the distribution of X plays a role into the, into the actual population quantity of a Briar score. And then the area under the curve is the same sort of logic, right? There's a statistic. So what if you calculate a Briar score typically as a concordance measure. So here, there was a model and it depended on a linear combination of X's. This was sort of the drive of a predicted probability so we have concordance of a prediction for observation I is higher than observation J and observation I actually had a worse outcome than observation J. So it's concordance of so a fraction of observations that are concordant is for, is for AUC. 
Okay, so it's it's here, and you can you can also write it as um, something dependent on sort of condition on mechanism and controls, condition on y equals zero and y equals one. And there's a similar concept. There is a true AUC, just getting by replacing these sums by expectations, essentially. So again, it integrates over the x distribution, integrates over the distribution of the population. Right? So again, you can so the distribution of x's play a role in what the definition is. So what quantity you're actually trying to estimate. Okay, and so, so these, so I'd say these, these population quantities where I'm integrating respect to the internal distribution are the true quantities I'm trying to estimate. And so those are the things I'm trying to get good estimates of, right? Now, so I haven't even got missing data at this point. But if I was just to use, hadn't didn't have any missing data and used a regular Briar score and eight and C index calculation, these are the quantities that, you know, with more, larger sample size, I'd be converging to. So these are the things I'm interested in. That's what I said. We want, we want to, that's the things we want to estimate. As if you didn't have any missing data, what quantity are you estimating? Um, okay, and this is what I've just been said a, a couple of times. The true values actually depend on the distribution of X, even if the model, the Y given X model is very good. Okay. Um, all right, so this is just saying the same thing I said before. We wanna get good estimates now when we've got some missing data. How do we go about getting missing data? So these formulas I showed before don't work because they, they don't, <laughs> sort of they don't, I'm missing some of the observations I need to calculate. Okay, so what's a complete case analysis here, right? So complete case means throw away observations who have any missing X's. So the so way you just write that is, so R equals one represents for cases fully observed and R equals zero represents it's got some missing X's. So with the Briar score, I just put RI in the numerator and denominator. That's just gonna count the, the complete observations, right? So that's for simple complete case evaluation of a Briar score and similarly for the C index. Right? So, so this is, you know, so this is, this is a complete case and this is gonna be okay if you had missing completely at random. It might not lack efficiency, but it's gonna work okay. It's not gonna be biased, but if you have missing at random or missing, not, a, not missing at random, I guess I should. Um, or missing not, yeah, actually which one? It didn't make, they change this, NMAR, MNAR, I'm not sure which is the right one these days. Anyway, um, but it doesn't, it, it's likely to be biased. Okay, so so the so there's what so what can you do? So you can I thought I had some other slides. Okay, let me let me do inverse probability weighting first. It's a bit easier to conceptualize. Um, so here's a here's the calc here's the inverse probability weighted version of a Briar score. You you do a weighted average of the complete cases. And so what are those weights? Those weights, you build a model for probably observing. The probability that X is not missing. You build a model for that. Take inverse of that, those are the weights, and just apply the complete cases, but a weighted version of it. And so you have to build a model for the probability of missingness. So should you include Y in that model or not? That's sort of a, a question. And you could do it either way. And then similarly, the C index is the same thing. You build a just a weighted version of a concordance index. Okay, for okay, I'm going to switch around here. I'm going to go to the augmented inverse probability weighting. So I expect some of you are aware, you know, inverse probability weighting tends to be have good bias properties, but not very efficient. And so there's quite some very clever work to sort of improve the efficiency of inverse probability methods by adding an augmented term into the, the estimated equation you solve. Okay, so this is, um, so, so, to, so that you add an augmented term and there's some nice theory which has some sort of double robustness properties. It's now gonna involve two models and either of those is, is correct, the, the method is unbiased and it tends to gain efficiency. So, so, the, so the, it needs an extra model. So you actually have to model the, 
x that's missing. So you have to make a model for x1 given the, you know, the other x's and y. And so the actual implementation of a method, you build a model, just like in multiple imputation, you build a model. But you build a model for the missing x, and then you create for everybody in the data set a prediction, like a mean prediction from that model, call that x star. And then, you, then there's an augmented term in the Briar score calculation where for every where you take the difference between what you got observed and this prediction from this model. And then the, the weights come into play. And here we've you no know, we're summing over everybody. You don't have to restrict your sum to the complete cases. So it tells you down the bottom if a subject is missing, they still contribute to the sum, and it's the second term, yi minus p star. And if they are complete, then it's yi minus a p hat, which you had before, weighted plus yi minus p star squared with one minus that weight. Right. So, it, and I'm not going to sort of go into the justification for this. This is actually an approximation to what you're supposed to do exactly in AIPW. The augmented term is just an approximation. Okay, so let me, oh, 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 sorry, I'm sure I thought about this better. Um, and so there's a, there's a version of this for the C index too. Um, that was Briar's score I showed you as AIPW for the C index. And so you can see this augmented term, the second term here. So it involves sort of this prediction model. So you have to, there's two models floating around when you use AIPW. There's a model for missingness and a model for the, for the X that is missing. You get to use them both. So you get to use all the data. So you can see it's probably going to be a bit more efficient and it has this nice double robustness property. Okay, and then multiple imputation is sort of the other method. So it, so you build, you just build a model for the X that's missing, X1. So either using the other X's and Y or just using the other X's. And so the, you have a multiple imputation, sorry, way it's implemented is you draw values from the x that's missing from that you know you build a model that model defines the distribution of the x that's missing you randomly draw a value from that from that distribution and you fill it in in the data so now you have a nice rectangular complete data set you can analyze you do that some number of times m5 50 some something like that um, it's five and fifty are quite different. Some 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 number bigger than one. Probably fifty is better than five if you can do it. Um, and so each data set has different filled in values because you draw from a distribution. So it's not. And so then you analyze each one of it separately, and there's pretty simple rules for combining to give you the final estimate and standard errors. And it gets more complicated if you've got more than one variable missing. So we've just implemented what's called the chained equation. You sort of impute the variables one at a time. Okay, so that's pretty obvious, that sort of standard thing. So again, the question, should you include Y in these models? Okay, I went for those. So, right, so I've described basically all the methods here. And um, so maybe, I don't know, happy to have a, maybe I'll take a five second pause. Anyone wants to ask a question? All right. Let's see a lit box lit up, but she didn't speak, so I'll just keep going. Um, okay, so we did, you know, this, you know, as this is a PhD dissertation, so of course they do a massive simulation study, sort of. A norm and dissertation. Um, so, you know, we generated some data where we had external and internal populations, and then we tried, you know, so then there's an external models given to you, and then we tried these various methods, and so they come in sort of groups. So there's, you know, we know what the target value is, because I told you there's a formula for, as a, you know, it's an expectation to give you the target value, and we it's a simulation study, so before, you know you simulate the full data and you delete some observations, right? So before we deleted them, you could calculate that. So that's full. So that should hit the target value. 
complete cases, you know, after we deleted some of the X's, use the complete case method. And then there's two versions of inverse probability weighting, depending on whether you included Y, the outcome variable method for making the model for R. Two versions of multiple imputation, depending on whether you included the value Y or not. And then the, the AIPW methods have two models, right? And a weight model and an imputation model, and I could include or not include Y in either of those. So those are what these four things are. Right? So, um, you know, so sort of a question you might, I mean, there's lots of questions here, but, you know, so complete cases is going to be biased quite often. Um, but, you know, within the inverse probably weighting, do, you know, comparing one and two, interest would include Y. Within the inverse, within multiple imputation, comparing one and two, and then within AIPW, the first one would be just ignoring Y, and the bottom one would be using Y in both models. Okay, so, you know, we generated data, and this is a simulation result, and there were, oh, I forget, what, five X's, I didn't actually type it at all, I should, I should have told you this. It's five X's and one of them's missing, and it's, and then, so what you're seeing on the, this is a results for AUC. It's a simulation study. So this on the left represents sort of a bias, on the right represents a variability of the estimates across the simulations. And you'll see four blocks, missing completely at random, and then missing at random just depending on X, or missing at random depending on X and Y, or missing not at random. Okay, so different patterns of missingness, and then Along the bottom here is these different methods. You know, the target value is the left-hand dot. Complete cases, CC, two well, inverse probability weighting, the two multiple imputation, and then the four AIP. Oops. So you can see, right? So missing completely at random, right? <laughs> Something clearly stands out, right? Missing multiple imputation. Ignoring Y. So multiple imputation where you just use the other X's it is, it is going to give you biased estimates. Um, but, you know, the other methods, IPW here, you don't get, you can ignore Y and not get a bias estimate. And then as you start to sort of make the missing, more missingness depend on X or depend on Y, some of these other methods start to have bias. So, for example, the so let's look at remit the third one down. Missingness when it depends on X and Y. Right, the inverse probability weighting method that doesn't use Y gives you bias, whereas if you do use Y, you don't get bias. And then these AIPW methods, basically the fourth one tends to work quite well. And then if you look at the efficiency, right? So what, what do you see? You see the multiple imputation number one. Which is the bias one is the most efficient in this case, so that's not it's good and bad, right? You sacrifice some, getting some efficiency, but you lost by you got losing bias. But but even when you do have missingness, it tends to be the multiple imputation methods are more efficient. And you see here that what the result that's sort of somewhat expected, the AIPW is a bit more efficient than the IPW. IPW is known to be fairly inefficient, and I don't remember the amount of missingness here. It's something like. 50%. Okay, so if you look at this, you overall multiple imputation number two, and I'm not really showing you everything, um, but AIPW number four is sort of tends to be good method. So, so from the simulations, in terms of bias and efficiency, multiple imputation that uses Y and the AIPW models that use Y as well. To, Small bias and, and sort of the most efficient within most classes. And the Briar score is sort of exactly the same. So small is small is good here. So multiple imputation ignoring Y is problematic. Multiple imputation tends to have more better efficiency. Excuse okay. me. Okay. Oh, nice a question. <laughs> <laughs> I ask a question, yes. About the, this result of simulation, was it expected that uh, augmented uh, inverse uh, probability of weighted be uh, as good for uh, version 4 when you include the Y 
in uh, the two parts of uh, in the two models and uh, the other version without uh, including y or including y on only uh, on one part one of the two models right right so so it doesn't so it if a missingness depends on y yes typically maybe, maybe in a, let me see maybe it shows it shows up better for the auc i think so when we're, when we're missing this depends on X, it doesn't matter too much if you include the Y. There's, there's a little bit of a matter in terms of bias. You can see a little bit of gain in efficiency, right? So these last number three and four have more inclusion of Y in them. So there's a little bit of gain in efficiency. In terms of bias, when we're missing this only depends on X, right? So if we go back, this is specifically what you were thinking. The number three and number four, right? So the number, right? Three and four, I'm including Y in the, in the imputation model, but it didn't seem to matter if I included it in the, in the weight, weight model. But then, right, and so I'm, I'm not, didn't talk about the bottom one, missing not at random. I mean, everything goes wrong there. Right? So, but it's, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, you can see, it's just much smaller. You can see in this one, missing this. It's a little bit of bias in some of them, number number one and number three. I think it says have a little bit of bias here. And we've seen this across the board. And it's, it's, not, it's not very big, right? So one and three have bias. So if you go back to what they are. So when missing this depends on why one and three have bias. So when, when that's the weight model, only, only depends on X. Right? So missing this depends on why probably need to put Y into the models. Okay. I don't know, you, you were skeptical or you're just curious? I, I was curious because uh, okay. I, uh, I expected a little bit more uh, bias uh, in the MAR XY. Typically, I, I uh, think that uh, the weight uh, should include Y. Uh, and uh, in both cases, uh, it seems that uh, MI, the MI model uh, should include uh, Y. But I know that uh, um, um, the augmented uh, inverse probability of weighting is uh, more robust than uh, standard uh, uh, IPW, but um, uh, it was not so clear for me that it was robust, even when we do not include the outcome. Right. No, it's, it's interesting. So, hi, I mean, you hi. do see. Oh, so, see hi, you. Jeremy. It's Rodolf. Uh, Hello. Glad you could <laughs> join. Nice to yeah, see you. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I interrupted you. It's just uh, to go to uh, an comment. And I'm sorry, I'm not very proactive because I must say that I'm also attending another meeting in Cincinnati where I am supposed to answer a question on a chat. So sorry <laughs> if I'm not 100 <laughs> with you. All right. Well, I won't. <laughs> I won't start the talk again for your benefit. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, so to take uh, Ellen's point, so don't you think that it's also depending on, on actually the simulations you are doing? So even though the, the methods could be a, a, a bit robust to, to, to this, it's, it's really depending on, on the, the scheme of your, of your simulations, no? Yes, and I didn't present exactly. Right, so we, I mean, we've got, so what, what I'm trying to think what we did here. Um, I mean, I mean, I think we have the X's are a combination of continuous, Gaussian, and binary. And then Y is binary based on the logistic regression model. And so, you know, that, that was our data structure, right? And so the models we use to impute or to fit R are, are generally linear models, right? So there's some, you know, you, there's some potential for misspecification there. But I mean, to some degree, you can check those models. You can sort of look a little bit and see how good those models are with the data you've got. And in fact, I mean, they are misspecified, right? If I, if I make y, you know, logis, logit function of probably y equals one linear in the x's, then the model for x1, which is continuous, given all the other x's and y is not linear. I mean, it's sort of a misspecified model anyway. So there is actually a little bit of misspecification going on. But, so I mean, but Helen, back to your point a little bit, right? So you can see him at this third one down, right? 
MAR depending on X and Y. I mean, but you know, the amount of a bias in the AIPW is less than in the inverse probability weighting. You know, so, so the using the augmented helped, I think. You know, even. And we've up, you know, so there's a paper which for just sort of going through about its fifth iteration of um, reviews. And so it'll hopefully I can send that if anyone wants to. It's got more simulations in it. Okay, so here's the summary. I think we more or less talked about that. Let's see if there's anything we can talk about. Um, so yeah, so the so yeah, there was just saying what well, I think we've just talked about it in all the slides. So you can read it maybe if you want. Um, so the multiple imputation, basically you need to include the outcome code. For inverse probability weighting methods, in some scenarios, it's not quite so important to include the outcome variable. Okay, so back to this CAPRA score. So again, it's just the same slide as before. This external model, and we've got a data set of 1,268 people, and one variable is missing 90%. So that's a lot of missing. Um, we made a binary outcome and applied all these methods. And let's remember the score again. I'll give it to you afterwards. I can tell you exactly how they came up with this, but it's somewhat entertaining from a, you know, a statistical point of view to see all the things they've they chose to do, which we perhaps you wouldn't do as statisticians. It may have a predicted probability, right? So for AUC, I just need the points. It just depends on the predicted score. I actually don't need the probability for AUC. But for the, um, to calculate Briar's score, you actually need a predicted probability. So these are the existing model predicted probabilities. So here's the, the results. So you can see a little bit. Now, so AUC on the left, so complete cases, which is 10% of the data, gives a point, I don't know, 0.79, right? Whereas the other methods are more like 0 0.75, 0 0.76. So that's actually quite a quite hard to change AUC value. So it's quite a bit, mo moderately big difference, 0 0.75 to 0.79. Um, and the ones we'd liked, right, were MI2 and AIPW4 seem to be quite similar here. You see, the, so we did com, we got confidence intervals. So this is just a bootstrap. Um, and and I should say in this setting, this variable that's missing is highly associated with the um, outcome. The, the proportion of um, yeah, the, the missingness is highly associated with the outcome. The, the, I don't know why that is, but uh, so that's the case. And so when you look at the Briar score, it's rather more dramatic, right? The complete cases using 10% of the data gives a very different Briar score than these other methods. IPW1, so it doesn't, you know, it's sort of not using the information on the, um, on the outcome. And I told you the outcome is highly related to the missing, missing this and to the, to the value. So that's why that's different. And then all the other methods are more or less the same. Okay, so it clearly makes a difference. So the, these ones are the, the best. I was I was wondering, Jeremy, uh, how do you explain this uh, huge drop between uh, IPW one and two that we don't see in the simulations, and no drop between uh, MI one and MI two, while we see such difference uh, in case yeah. of missing at random. Uh, depending on why in the simulation. I have yeah, difficulties no. to see uh, the, the link between them. Right. So why is IPW1? Why does that not? So for the complete cases, it's sort of obvious why it's just, I mean, just less data. Um, I mean, you got to remember these IPW, they're only analyzing 10% of the data and putting in Mm. So, so in your simulation, what was the percentage of missingness? I think it was forty to fifty percent. So. Ah, okay, so that might be yes. Well, in link with the with the the, the comment of Rodolphe, it depends on maybe the scenario and. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Let me, okay. I mean, did we see any evidence in the simulation of? No, I thought we did not see anything. I mean, 
here, right? This third yeah. one down. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's oh, modestly yeah. different, right? It is modest. Yeah, that, that's exactly the same as uh, MI. That's, it's the difference. Uh, yeah, right. Okay. Well, um, right. But well, there's different maybe. models, right? I guess the, yeah, yeah. the MI modeling is somehow you doing it, including a useful model, maybe that's, maybe that's the answer, right? That model is useful because it's modeling relationship between X and Y, right? Whereas the IPW1 is only modeling the missingness. Maybe that, that model isn't quite so useful in some way. Exactly. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fairly yeah. dramatic. Yeah, may, maybe, maybe the missing algorithm is only due to Y, while in your simulation setting it was due to X and Y. So that might yeah, yeah. also come yes, from could that. Be. Yeah. Okay. Could be. That's right. That's right. Okay, so um, so we've got just a couple more slides. So, uh, um, so a sort of summary. So, just I didn't quite appreciate till we went worked through this. But you know, these AUCs uh, actually depend on the population distribution of the X's, which is a bit of a sort of worrisome concept if you're thinking what does validation mean. Um, different ways of handling missing data give you quite different estimates. Um, for multiple imputation, you should include Y. IPW, when the missingness depends on Y, it's better to include Y. And there's sort of no harm for including Y in the model. Really. And we, we found multiple imputation can be more efficient. So there's some papers here. So this first paper, Chi Long, it's somewhat related, although they had a different AIPW method. So this is this paper by Moon, as I mentioned, a lot of citations. This is just a reference for multiple imputation of chained equations and another reference for you know, a augmented inverse probability weighting. So last slide, I wanted to show you sort of the intuitive explanation of why you needed to include Y when you do multiple imputation. So this is sort of a general slide. So I'll, I'll try to walk, walk through it a little bit and you'll see that. So if you think of, sort of a Bayesian justification for multiple imputation. Um, so I have some quantity of interest here, it'll be AUC, but it could be a parameter. I can think of AUC as a parameter, if you like, some population quantity. So there's a quantity of interest and I have data. And I'm, so I'm gonna apply some method, analyze the data I have. So if you observe data, I'm just gonna sub denote by D of OBS. So things that are missing, D miss. Right, so in this setting, the observed data is the X's that I've got to get to observe and the Y, and the missingness is that miss, you know, bits of X comma are missing. And so from a Bayesian perspective, what you want to do is give some a posterior distribution for this quantity, this parameter, the thing you see, given the observed data, right? And so, so the whole point of this is multiple imputation is a device to just integrate out over missing data distribution. And so just that's so that's what this is writing out. So just expanding out this posterior distribution of Q giving the observed data. So, so I'm just introducing the missing data and then integrating it out, right? So this is just an identity in sort of very loose terms. Um, and so if you look at these this formula here, this is exactly the recipe for multiple imputation. Right? You fill in the distribution of missing data giving the observed data. So that's, that's the imputing step. So you have to build models there for sure. And then you fill that, once you fill that in, you get a post, you get an, you know, you, it's easy. You got a rectangular data set. Now you got, you know, you can get a posterior distribution of Q more easily from that rectangular data. Right? And then integrating is averaging. So, you know, each time you fill in a data set, you get a slightly different posterior distribution, right? It shifts around a little bit depending on how you filled in the missing values. And then they randomly draws. And then you average those, and that's what multiple imputation is. So it's just a device to integrate out over missing data. Right? So although you're actually making up data on, as a process, it's purely it's a numerical integration. Okay, so, so within here, right, this for D miss given D obs is imputation. The, the, the posterior distribution given a completed data. So that's just calculating the posterior distribution, averaging it. 
So note here, right? so when you fill in the missing data, it's from a distribution of D miss given D obs. Well, the D obs involves Y, it's observed data. Right? And it's going to re you require, when you fill in, the, when you calculate the posterior distribution from the completed data, uh, that calculation involves Y as well as involving X. Right? So you need to have Y in here. So you need to, you can't, you can't drop Y from the D obs here when you do the imputation. So this is the, you know, the intuition of why you, you need to include Y always when you do multiple imputation. If you just think of it as a device to do numerical integration, a device to allow you to give the posterior distribution given the data you've observed. And so I think that's part of a reason why there's, you know, a lot, I don't know how much you guys use multiple imputation, but when you talk to, you know, scientists who aren't in statistics, they're very reluctant to, to want you to use Y to help with multiple imputation, but, but you have to. If you don't do that, you're messing up. So. Have, you, have, right. you, have you tried to, uh, to convince the skepticals with uh, this demonstration? Have you tried? Well, it, well, you know, statisticians get, can understand this. Yeah, but statisticians <laughs> are not that's, skeptical about uh, why we should <laughs> use that'd be, why. The other way to, to think about it, if, you, if there is an association between Y and X1, where X1 is missing and there is an association between Y and X1, if you did imputation and didn't use Y, you know, you'd, you'd be distorting in the data you filled in, there'd be a distorted association between X1 and Y in the filled in data. Where, whereas if you fill it in using Y, you're not distorting that association between Y and X1. So that's sort of maybe. Yeah. If I may, I, if I may, I think that your slide is fantastic. I, I, I hope that we could, uh, we could have it because uh, for teaching uh, students in statistics, it's really fine. But the, the issue is that the skeptical are not the statistician. And because well, some, some are, some are. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? So uh, am I wrong when, when I'm saying that uh, it's from the beginning we know that we, we need to include why? It's, if you are not doing that, it's improper imputation. It's, it has been described from the beginning. Yes, yeah, sure. Well, but no, but I mean, I think people need to see it demonstrated because there is, there is definitely this intuition, but it's, it's circularity here. But, yeah, my, I mean, my colleague Matt was pretty skeptical until he saw this. Really? Okay. I did but yeah, so, but okay, but, but educatable, right? Statisticians <laughs> can, can can get this, right? <laughs> if if they think about it, I mean, it take you know, you have to work. I mean, it's not totally, you know, it's it's a sort of like a result, right? It's not like just obvious. It's a result you have to sort of work through and think through to to get it as statisticians, but. But I think the second explanation is possibly one which people will understand better if you... If you, if you are looking, for example, I, I remember there is another one with um, uh, Jonathan Stern and Margaret May. Uh, actually, there was a, a published paper in BMJ uh, was actually was wrong because they did not include Y in multiple imputation. And so then they, they did another paper to explain why it was wrong. And so it's more, you know, for the clinicians and the epidemiologists. Uh, so right, right. if you don't know this paper, I will try to find it and, and send it to you because it's, uh, I think it's a... Uh, it's 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 just an application showing showing the issue then. I mean, I'm happy to send me slides. I'll send Boris. I'll send them to you. Great, thanks. I'll I'll circulate them around. Um, we have time for maybe a, one or two quick questions. So thanks again, Jeremy, for your talk. It was so clear as usual. Thank you. Right. Nice to see your smiling faces, everybody. <laughs> so Ra Rudolph is the one who found me in an apartment when we came to live in Bordeaux. I don't know if you, I don't know if you bribed the person, Rudolph, but you found us a very nice apartment. So we always appreciate you. <laughs> and you're still very welcome if you come, if you want to come yeah. back. <laughs> well, I was going to come to Lyon, but not. But I don't think that's not happening. Right? It's much Next better year. in Bordeaux. You shouldn't go in Lyon. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> All right. Um, well, if no one has any uh, burning questions um, on top of this very interesting discussion, uh, we can uh, thank Jeremy uh, once more. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk.